More player season reviews today. We're going to look back at the Pacers season of 2021-22 for three reserve slash starting wings. Buddy Heald, Keelan Martin, and Justin Anderson as we wrap up almost looking back on last season on today's Locked on Pacers podcast. You are Locked on Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers. As always, my name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the Westside Community News. And today, we're going to go back to reviewing the seasons of Pacers players for the 2021-22 season, looking at three reserve wings. We got two player groups left, the reserve wings that we'll do today, and then the fun one for next week, the starting guard. So today we'll do Buddy Heald. I had to squeeze him into some group. He was the hardest guy to find a spot for. Keelan Martin and Justin Anderson on the reserve wing grind. What we learned about the player, what their future is with the team, good and bad about their season. As you know, we'll do the whole nine yards. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about Jalen Duran as we continue the prospect breakdowns. The center from Memphis, I just said his name very wrong. Uh, and then next week we will do, I believe, Jaden Ivey and Johnny Davis as we continue looking at draft prospects for the Pacers. So you will not want to miss that. The season reviews of Halliburton, Brogdon, and Karis Overt will all be next week as well. And some rumor roundup for the first time of the summer. So lots to coming up on today's are on this show. But today is about Buddy Heald, Keelan Martin, and Justin Anderson. Let's start with looking back at Buddy Heald's abbreviated Pacers season. I say abbreviated because... He only played 26 games for the Pacers after being traded. Now, what's really funny about Buddy Heald is he is a health guru. Like, that dude does not miss games. He has barely sat out uh, in his entire career. He played 81 games this past season, all 26 for the Pacers. That's what makes him pretty valuable for a team that's missed a bunch of games. But that's not what makes him good to me. You know, what was really interesting about Buddy Heald that makes it really fascinating to evaluate his 2021-22 campaign is, you know, he joins the Pacers from the Kings, right? And he clearly didn't like playing in Sacramento. Like, he made that pretty clear his first day talking to us in the media. And, you know, was excited for the change of scenery. And he still got to play with two of his former teammates in in, uh, Tristan Thompson and and Tyrese Halberton. But then he comes to Indiana, and he doesn't just, you know, play like a happier player. He played like a whole different player. And that's one of the good things I put about Buddy Heald's season is he came to the Pacers and just transformed his game. His two-point percentage with the Kings this season, 41.9. With the Pacers, 54 0.9 0.9 rebounds per game with the Kings, four with the Pacers, 5.1 assists, 1.9 with the Kings, 4.8 with the Pacers. His steals were up, his blocks were up, and some of these numbers jumped because his minutes jumped. But if you even go to the per 36 numbers, most of these numbers did, in fact, improve coming from the Kings to the Pacers. And Buddy Heald just became a whole different guy. He was sniffed a triple double several times, and that was a big thing about his season is, you know, I was never that into Buddy Heald as a player with the Kings. But with the Pacers, he was a kind of like secondary creator-ish player. That's a little generous. You know, he's still not throwing guys open, but was a valuable creator, still a good shooter that the team sort of desperately needed, even though the percentage doesn't perfectly bear that out. He shot a lot of them. He's a willing shooter. He's a threat from there. The fact that he was able to rebound was impressive. His defense still needs a lot of work, but you know, the way he grew in basically every area of the game, or at least was more dialed in, and every aspect of the game was really, really huge. So that was something that I thought was noteworthy for him, and the shooting was another one, right? Rick Carlisle got a shooter and used him perfectly, and all that tied together to kind of what I when I think back on the good of Buddy Heald's season, a really strong offensive impact. And this will come up later when I talk about Buddy Heald. With Buddy Heald on the floor for the Pacers this past season, 121.2 offensive rating. Wow. For the YouTubers, you can see I'm making a wow with my face. Very impressive numbers there. For Buddy Heald, the defensive rating way worse with him on the floor, but his offensive impact was huge. And for a young team, that had some value because it gave space for young guys to grow and improve. So that is where he kind of shined in his first stint or season, whatever you want to call it, with the Pacers. Now, what was bad about Buddy Heald's season? And some these are two things that have haunted him his entire career. One is the defensive end of the floor, right? As much as he was able to laser in and be a better player in every facet of the game after being traded to the Pacers, I don't think his defense improved very much. After being traded, I think he's still a pretty sloppy on-ball defender. Definitely a drifter away from the play. You know, he sort of comes from the Jeremy Lamb school of defense where it's kind of matadory and then they reach for the steal in, in, in a weird time. So sometimes they look like they have good steal numbers, but that comes at the expense of quite a few 
baskets for the other team, and his steal numbers don't even look that great. So he does get beat off the dribble quite a bit. His size is kind of limiting. You know, he's not short, but at 6'4", for a two-guard, there are a lot of guys taller than him at that position nowadays. So that is one end of the floor and one aspect of his game that I think Buddy Heald really needs to work on, and we'll talk about that in the improvement section. The other big downside to Buddy Heald's game, you know, for a guy that's lauded as this elite shooter because he's in the top 10 and three-pointers made every season, he's a threat from beyond the arc, defenders are glued to him, right? He definitely has spacing value, but he's not that efficient of a player. His true shooting percentage is only 56.3. Why is that? Because Buddy Heald is one of the worst players in the NBA at getting to the free throw line with his skill set. 8.6 free throw rate for Buddy Heald. That is shockingly low for a guard who handles the ball as often as he does. Most of his free throws, too, are technical foul free throws because he's really good at making them, so he still gets chosen for them. But that really boosts his free throw rate. Like, think of guys on the pit. Like, Chris Duarte is not a guy I thought got to the free throw line very much this season. He has an 18% free throw rate. That's over twice as high as Buddy Heald's. Torrey Craig had a higher free throw rate <laughs> than, than Buddy Heald. Justin Holiday did with the Pitchers. Your keeper Sykes as well. Like, Buddy Heald never gets to the free throw line, and that really hurts the, his efficiency because that's the most efficient shot in basketball is a free throw, and it really hurts the, the total impact he's able to have because, yeah, 56% true shooting is fine, especially when it's coming on all shots, like, like field goal attempts. But if you get to the free throw line, you become way more efficient really quickly. That's something that TJ Warren, for example, also has as a limitation. I think if Buddy Heald could improve in that way, it would help him a lot. But still, even beyond that, the the area for growth for him has got to be the defense. Like He's got to get better on that end of the floor. That could take him from you know, a really solid offensive player, one that is still helpful for a lot of teams, especially on like a good team where he could be hidden a little better on defense or where he would just be asked to shoot threes and very rarely handle the ball if he would take that role, he'd be really valuable. Like Elite teams would love to have a guy like Buddy Heald on their team, and improving those foul shots would be huge for him as well. So one stat that tells it all for Buddy Heald's season. I got two, and they both kind of relate to the way he grew into his role with the Pacers and the way he was able to benefit the Pacers franchise. One is his average shot distance. That's a super niche stat, but I thought it was cool the way it kind of told the story for him. You know, with Sacramento kind of, you know, didn't like his role, settled for more shots, was more resigned to the corner. That's at least what he would said. I don't know if that was totally baked in reality, but still. His average shot distance with the Kings this season, 20.8 feet. And in his career, it's over 18 feet for the last couple seasons. It's hovered around 19.20. With the Pacers, it was 17.7 feet, right? Three feet lower than it was with the Kings this season because he was really dialed in and focused on getting more to the basket, right? He took Way more shots from zero to three feet this season than he has since 2017-18, his second year with the Kings, and the third highest of his career, right? With the Pacers, he was getting to the basket. He was taking more shots from three to 10 feet, right? Like the Carlisle system was very good for him in terms of getting to those spots, and he finished well at the rim. So that was a really big change for him in his in his game is attacking the basket more. That allowed him to be the playmaker that got almost five assists per game. No one really thinks of Buddy Heald that way, but those are shockingly good numbers for him in the assist department. So driving to the basket, lowering that shot distance, putting pressure on the rim is one stat that sort of tells it all about his transformation as he got to the Pacers. And I already mentioned the other one, but that offensive impact plus 11 on off on offense for him is insane. Now minus eight on off on defense is terrible, but that's still a plus three net on off for Buddy Heald, which is very good. He obviously fits well with the way Carlisle wants to play offense and that's really helpful for him. So he was a very strong positive in the impact metrics this year. And I think his growth coming to the Pacers and his ability to get more pressure on the rim was a big part of that. So what's next for Buddy Heald? What's his future hold? I think zooming out, not looking at you know the changing landscape of any NBA team in the offseason. If he is back with the Pacers, I would think, you know, assuming what they have right now, like Brogdon, Duarte, and Halliburton should be the starting one, two, three for the Pacers next year. I don't think that's a secret. Now, Brogdon could obviously be traded, and Buddy Heald could obviously be traded. So there's a lot that could change there. But assuming, you know, going off of what we have right now uh, in terms of information about the Pacers roster, I would be, I would think Buddy Heald would be like the, a sixth man. I think he'll fit the sixth man role, and he'd be pretty good in that, you know, especially if he's still in that mindset of being a playmaker, not a playmaker, but putting more pressure on the rim and kind of being more dynamic in his offensive role because then he could, he could not run the second unit but be a little more of a – of a playmaking role with that group instead of just being a microwave score off the bench. That said, look, a lot of the arguments made by me even for trading guys like Brogdon or Turner or whatever vet you choose, McConnell, there's a bunch. There's not a bunch, but there's enough to talk about it. You know, a lot of the arguments are like they're old. They're outside the Pacers' core age range. And I've made that argument myself. 
And it's nice to have vets on young teams and, you know, Buddy Heald can be helpful in that role. But I think that if you're going to make the argument that like Mal- trading Malcolm Brogdon makes some sense because, you know, he's, he turns 29 or it's almost 30. this He turns 30 this year. You know, it's outside the Pacers core range. You know, TJ Warren turned 29 this year. Turner turns 26 this year. He's still young. But, you know, Buddy Heald is six days younger than Brogdon. They're basically the same age, right? So I think that there's a chance that they could look to move him a lot because of his age, but also because, you know, look at the Lakers tried to acquire him last season. Like his sort of shooting could be in demand as sort of a neutral contract that's still big. So I think there's a chance Buddy Heald gets traded. That said, in terms of the vets the Pacers would be looking to move, you know, I think his offensive impact and those on-off being so high has a lot of value, like I mentioned earlier, for these young players. Like if you're a young team and you can just stick Buddy Heald in the game, even if he doesn't touch the ball once, and I don't think he would like that, but if he's just running around the perimeter, that makes the game four-on-four elsewhere, and that's helpful to get reps and space for those young players to grow. Now, eventually they'll have to face adversity in a tighter court, but that is a helpful environment for developing guys who need to develop those skills. So it would make sense to keep him around to me. I don't think it's like a lock that he'd be traded or back with the team necessarily, but I think there's value in both, both in that he can play a lot of roles. He's very healthy, uh, but he also could fetch the pace for something interesting as a trade guy. So there's a lot of, of thoughts for what his future is. I think it's probably a slightly, slightly, slightly more likely that he is back with the team, but you know, you never know. The Pacers roster could be so dynamic this offseason that it's really hard to say what any one player's future could hold in Buddy Heald's is no different. He does become extension eligible after July 1st, which could sort of change the calculus of what his worth is to the Pacers. That will be a podcast that comes after free agency. Let's move on to Keelan Martin, a guy that spent a short time with the Pacers this season before being cut in early January. Had a very weird (laughs) campaign. Really improved on one of the floor and really kind of fell off on the other. We'll do Justin Anderson at the end before... We talk about either of those guys, though. I want to talk about Rock Auto, who is bringing you this episode of Lockdown Pacers. And with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models of vehicles, it is now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure the pointless and intimidating questioning from the guy behind the counter who's asking about specs of your vehicle that you don't even know, and then wait while the guy behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, only choosing the brand their warehouse carries. Then they order it to the warehouse. you got to go get it. That sucks. You have a computer with access to rockauto.com or right in your pocket on your phone, and you can save time and money when using Rock Auto. They're a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are already reliably, always reliably low for every customer, and they have everything you could need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, new carpet, you name it, they got it. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in there. Had you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, go check out Locked On NBA Big Board to hear more about all of the latest prospects in and around the NBA. Those guys know their stuff, and they go to these workouts and watch these guys all the time. That's your place for draft content. We'll have draft content here tomorrow. Talking about Jalen Duran from Memphis on tomorrow's Locked on Pacers podcast. Let's review Keelan Martin's 2021-22 season like Buddy Heald's. A little abbreviated. Everybody's season today with the Pacers was a little short. This was the low-end wings group in terms of games played with the Pacers. Keelan Martin, 27 games with the Pacers. What a season for him. First of all, very impressive the way he was able to fight through his contract situation. Right, He had a non-guaranteed deal. He pushed it back so that he could get into training camp, assuming the Pacers didn't need to clear his roster spot. And they didn't. They didn't end up making any moves that required that. Makes it into camp. Edmund Sumner gets hurt. They have to shovel the roster even more. He pushes the date back again. Ends up making the team. Gets paid enough you know, to make it all worth it. He had to fight for that roster spot. And that was impressive. And so what stood out to me about Keelan Martin's season, beyond that resiliency to make the team, was the defense. Like He really improved as a defender this season for the Pacers at that wing spot. Being a 6'5 guy, but being 230, like he was pretty bulky. So he was not like fast, but he was quick enough to stand in front of a lot of these guards. He was pretty good at guarding some quicker guards on the perimeter. I liked his defensive impact and growth this season. I think that's where a lot of his impact showed for the Pacers this year. Best defensive box plus minus of his career this season for the Pacers. That was pro- probably the best part, to me at least, of his season and the best you know, on off he's had with this team. And another thing that was really good about Keelan Martin for a guy who had the ball, not a lot, but more than he's had in the past, they they kind of relied on him a little more than 
than they have in past seasons. His usage was over 18%. Low turnover guy, right? For as often as he has the ball, he does not make many mistakes on either end. You know, he's he's not like the most athletic guy or the quickest guy necessarily, but he doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He's really dialed in when he's out there. He's just not the most capable of doing some of the high-level stuff that makes players dominant or worthy of a ton of minutes. Now, on the flip side, you know, what made Keelan Martin special in 2020-21 under Bjorkren is that, you know, his defense was worse than it was this past season, but his offense was really, really strong, right? 40% from three, 90% free throw shooter, clearly efficient as a guy you could have out there at all times. And at the rim, that was his worst season, but still good enough that he had an efficient season. This season, the rim part was good, right? He improved there, but the three-pointer completely went away. It went back to his rookie season levels, 29.3%. On three pointers and the free throws disappeared too, down to 69%. And that's tiny volume. But for a guy that is kind of thought of to me, at least as a more efficient guy to only go 22 of 75 from deep was really killer for his game. He couldn't, you know, he, he one year was the three guy, but not the D guy. And then this past season was the D guy, but not the three guy. Like the idea of Keelan Martin putting both of those together seems like a kind of valuable bench guy that you'd like to have around and potentially have as a depth piece. Maybe the Pacers pursue that in the future. You know, I think he, for example, we'll talk about Justin Anderson in the next segment. I think Keelan Martin is better than Justin Anderson, especially the actualized version of Keelan Martin, right? He had some huge games. If you remember, this is two seasons ago. This is not reviewing his past season. But he had huge games for the 2020-21 Bjork and Pacers, right? He had a 25-point game in Cleveland to help the Pacers. I think they clinched their playoff or play-in ticket that day. He had double digits in all of their last three games. He had like three threes and an overtime win over the Spurs in like his first game in the rotation of the entire season. Like he had some huge moments for them that season. And then this past season with injuries to like Warren and Duarte getting hurt and stuff like Rick Carlisle stuck him in the rotation for like a month and a half, you know, till mid December, he was basically playing in every game, but the shots weren't there. He very rarely cracked double digits. Only four times did Keelan Martin crack double digits from November 1st to the end of December before he was ultimately let go. So you know, the shot was just not there for him. The offensive punch went away, even though the defensive punch was there. And that's why Carlisle was so willing to play him all the time. But the shooting efficiency just rarely made it worth it. And so, you know, remember at the end of December, he played against the Hornets, played 20 minutes, right? He was still kind of firmly a guy that Carlisle relied on. But then he was one of their first guys to go into health and safety protocols. And so when Lance Stevenson and Kiefer Sykes were both, you know, stronger guards that the Pacers needed at that time, they had no quality guard play. Keelan Martin became... The waived sacrifice. So I think that the bad about his season part really killed him because he had an opportunity to be in the rotation for a long time, but he just couldn't make the shots to stay on the floor. So once more healthy bodies at his position appeared, he couldn't stay out there. One stat that tells it all to me about Keelan Martin's season, one is that efficiency, that true shooting percentage, right? That's the reason he didn't finish the season with the team. If you'll remember, you know, at the time when the Pacers were trying to keep Lance and figuring out what to do, I kind of thought there was a chance Lance wouldn't stick with the team or they would hardship him all the way till the trade deadline just because you know, I wasn't sure they were going to be able to cut Keelan Martin. Like He kind of had some value to them at the time. But the true shooting percentage, ghastly low, 49.2% with the Pacers. That is as low as it's been for him in any stop of his career. Now, actually, with the Celtics, <laughs> he played for the Celtics for three games after his Pacers stint and missed every shot he took with Boston. So, of course, he had zero true shooting there on three shot attempts. That does not count. But his 40... 6% or excuse me, 49% with the Pacers this year was way too low, even for a guy that had some defensive specialist capabilities to keep him on the floor. And like Buddy Heald, a problem for him is the free throw rate. Like even though the three wasn't falling, he shot well at the rim this season and improved his cutting a little bit, you know, as a 65% at the rim guy, that's kind of valuable. Decent mid range score, right? He was like handling around screens a little bit this season, but he can't get to the free throw line. I just dogged on Buddy Heald's free throw rate of 8%. Keelan Martin's this season was lower than that. <laughs> Keelan Martin's free throw rate this season was 7.7%, right? That is where he's also missing a big part of being an efficient player is getting to the free throw line. Think about Justin Anderson, who we'll talk about in the last segment. Again, I'm not trying to dog on anyone specifically, but even Justin Anderson, who no one thinks of as like this draw fouls, get to the line behemoth, had a 17.2% free throw rate with the Pacers. That's twice as high as Buddy Heald and Keelan Martin. That kind of shows you how low their rates are and how ineffective they were at getting to the line, which is such a key skill for guys who need to find a way to, to be more efficient. So I think Keelan Martin, for to grow, he's going to have to get better at creating shots. I don't mean, just mean like off the dribble, because he showed a little bit of flashes of that at times this season, coming around screens. But 
some off the dribble, some for his teammates. He's not necessarily a good passer. And some off ball. Like he's not necessarily a good cutter or getting open away from the play because he's not the quickest. I think all those skills in tandem would help him, despite him being a dog on defense and at times looking like a guy who could be a good shooter. So Keelan Martin not with the Pacers at the end of the season. Hard to say if he'll have any future with the team. He is technically two-way contract eligible. So perhaps he could come back on a two-way. Maybe the Pacers decide to do, you know, I talked about with Justin Anderson, have him be the 15th guy on the roster, only 26, you know, right around Miles Turner's age. Perhaps could be a fit to return to the team. But instead of talking about his future, what I do with these guys who didn't finish the season with the team is I talk about something I learned from them or something the Pacers can learn from them. And with Keelan, what I wrote is how much defense is required for a role guy with a really negative offensive impact to be a positive player. Because I think Keelan Martin was like a, a positive defender this year, at like at least a neutral defender, but he was just so bad on offense that it, it didn't really matter. He was still a negative out there. And so for a team that stunk on defense to not be able to find a role for that guy kind of shows what he needed to have on offense. And you kind of have to have something on offense in today's NBA because even if you're just a quality defender, you can still have negative implications on your team. So... You learn a little bit about that, and at, at the role player level, those kind of weaknesses get really highlighted. One more guy to highlight today, Justin Anderson in his season. We did talk about him a little bit yesterday as we talked about his free agency, uh, but this time we're going to focus more on the games he played and what his future could look like with the Pacers in the league and all that sort of stuff. Before we do that, though, I want to talk to you guys about Truebill because do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel. Truebill makes it super simple. Link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions with one tap and they have a Truebill concierge there to help you cancel those subscriptions so you don't even have to sometimes. They have over 2 million users and have helped them save over $100 million. You've got to try it yourself. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now, Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. You could save thousands a year. Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day for your second listen. Locked On NBA is the way to go. So you can hear more about Heat Celtics Game 5 if you even want to. That is the ugliest basketball game ever. The Heat have 68 points. With six minutes to go, looking like Pistons Pacers from 2003 for those who remember that series. But you can hear all about that and the latest news around the NBA coaching searches, offseason chatter, all that on the Lockdown NBA podcast. Let's talk about Justin Anderson. The last, I, I don't want to say that he's not interesting, but compared to Halliburton, uh, Brogdon, and Lavert on our player season reviews next week, you know, we're kind of digging into our last bench player, our low minutes guy, low games guy, whatever you want to call it. Here on Lockdown Pacers with Justin Anderson, who joined the team two different stints. First time, if you'll remember, on a COVID hardship deal in early January. And then again for two different 10 days at the end of the season, earned through fantastic play with the Mad Ants. And so if you want to talk about the good of his season, first of all, just look at his Fort Wayne play. Like He was one of the best five players in the G League this past season. That probably cemented him a spot in the NBA next season somewhere. Like Usually those good G League guys get some sort of call. Shot 40% from deep in the G League, got the free throws up. Almost 28 points per game. Good passing, great rebounding. Like, he was just a dog at that level. And that was really impressive about his season. But we're talking about the Pacers here today. He got called up to the Pacers thanks to that strong play. And the offense never really translated. You know, he did have a pair of 18-point games where he looked pretty effective, especially shooting the ball in both of those games, but mostly inconsistent. But what stood out to me about Justin Anderson was a couple things. You know, one is the playmaking part is not something you really think about with Justin Anderson ever in his career. But that sort of translated to the Pacers. Over two assists a game in his low-minute role. There's way more than he's had at any point in his career before. In fact, the only time he was over one assist per game was a brief stint with Philly in the 2016-17 season. So his playmaking definitely has improved from the G League level to the pro level. And that carried this season, which was huge for him. Even his assist percentage was up much higher this season than it was in past seasons. And that made him a much more dynamic offensive player. Instead of just being a spot-up guy or just being an off-ball guy in the dunker spot or something like that, he could handle it a little bit and not have it be embarrassing. And what, what compounds that and makes it even more impressive, he never turned it over, right? Really low turnover rate with the Pacers this season. You don't think of Justin Anderson as a passer, and you shouldn't, but 27 assists and only six turnovers in 13 games for the Pacers, 270 minutes. That's pretty good stats. I think he did pretty well showing off some playmaking chops this year. And his on-ball D is very effective, you know, 
like Keelan Martin, similar build, 6'6", 230. Those guys can be up in your face and still move and stay with you and make life pretty hard for you. And he showed that quite a bit in his stint with the Pacers this past season. Now, where he needs to improve, look, he showed it with the Mad Ants. So sometimes it's hard to say this stuff, but his efficiency with the Pacers was pretty ghastly. Could not get the three to fall 24.5% with the Pacers. That number being higher would have made him almost a guy they would have liked to keep through the end of the season because his two-pointer was effective. He was finishing at the rim. He just could not get the three to go. True shooting percentage, 47.5% with the Pacers. For reference, his career low prior to that, 52% back with Carlisle in Dallas during his sophomore season. So definitely something that escaped him this season, lower offensive impact as a result, even though his defense still had value. That said, another low point for Justin Anderson this season, his team defense was not as good as the Pacers would hope. And they had a lot of team defense issues, so I say that about a lot of guys. Perhaps it's a scheme thing, who knows, but his team defense wasn't all the way there. Like a lot of these young guys who play little lesser roles, you know, sometimes it felt like they were kind of floating on that end of the floor and not quite the impact guy either in pick-and-roll situations or as a weak side help defender, whatever team setting you would like to describe. You know, being at the nail, being in passing lanes. He just wasn't as strong in those areas as you'd like for a guy who is such a strong on-ball defender and you know, when the games are meaningless like they were for the Pacers so often, and Justin Anderson, most of his time spent with the team, was in meaningless games. But you'd like to see a little more engagement and effort in the team defense department. But again, I think still better defender than offensive player. So once that, that kind of tells it all for Justin Anderson. First of all, the drop in inefficiency from the G League to the Pacers was a killer. Because if that could have been higher... Uh, that that could have really helped him. Like he could have been a guy that they would like to keep going into next season, almost certainly, right? Like that's a guy you don't you need to open up a roster spot for at the end of a season if you have this efficient, strong on-ball defender. Not quite three and D, but pretty close. And that's a guy you want to keep around. So if he can improve that efficiency, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the stat that tells it all for a season, like for a guy they were hoping could be the level of player he was in the G League, Justin Anderson. Just was not that when he came to the Pacers. And another one I have down is his defensive on-off stats, right? Justin Anderson had a really bad negative defensive on-off, which is crazy when you think about his perception. 123 defensive rating with Justin Anderson on the floor, 116 with him off. His team defense just has to be better if he's going to have any impact going forward because that does not match his reputation necessarily, but that is definitely was the case. His team defense was really crippling for the Pacers this season. An area for growth beyond what we just talked about, you know, improving the three ball, improving that team defensive principle stuff, stuff that is true for any player who's sort of inexperienced despite him being in the league for a long time, only like 3,000 minutes in his career. Uh, I think consistency. (laughs) It's a pretty lame kind of cop-out thing to say, but Justin Anderson on his best nights, you know, the 18-point game he had against Portland and a win, an 18-point game against Toronto, 13 points against Denver. He looks really effective those games. Big plus-minus positive in those games more engaged on the defensive end, more useful for the team. Those are the games he ends up playing the most minutes. And some of that is he scored a lot because he played a lot, but some of it is he was able to play a lot because he was scoring well. So some some cart horse situation stuff going there. That said, um, our chicken egg, not cart and horse. That's the wrong phrase. That's embarrassing. Um, that said, if he could be a little more consistent on a night-to-night basis in every aspect of the game, not just in terms of shooting efficiency, but – in terms of defensive focus and how strong his on-ball defense is and how much his playmaking is there. You know, his playmaking would go from a week of four assists every single game to then a big drop-off on the way out. Like, that kind of stuff can't really happen. So a little more consistency in his game, I think, would go a long way because he really looked stronger his first 10 days with the Pacers at the end of the season than his second 10 days. So what's next for Justin Anderson? Well, I talked about this yesterday, and I kind of brought it up with Keelan Martin, but I think he'd be a fine if you're the Pacers who have very few wings on the team right now or are slated to have very few on the team. Next season, as a good 15th man kind of wing, maybe a guy you bring on on a non-guaranteed minimum deal or a partially guaranteed minimum deal to, you know, try him out basically for the first couple months of the season, see if he's a good fit and keep him around. And if not, cut him for a new roster spot partway through the season. You know, they know he fits well with the Mad Ants. He's not 2A eligible, unlike Keelan Martin. Um, So they'd have to sign him to a deal, but perhaps they want him in the Mad Ants still. They love to promote those guys when they play well. And if he has another really strong G League year, he could be due for an NBA deal in his future. So he probably is willing to go into that ecosystem again, especially one where he looked very strong. So perhaps he'd be willing to go back to the Mad Ants or in a training camp with the Pacers. And I think that that's a potentially logical fit for his free agency this summer. But it's hard to say. And with those bit players at the end of the roster, you know, it's really hard to determine what their priorities are and what the Pacers are in those interactions as well. But if you listen to yesterday's show, the comparison I made was like, why not like the Jakar Sampson 
you know, 15th man minimum contract kind of signings that Pacers made two summers in a row. What What's preventing Keelan Martin and Justin Anderson from being that guy? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. So we'll see. Maybe he's back with Fort Wayne. Maybe he gets an offer from another team with fully guaranteed money because, again, he was one of the best five guys in the G League this past season. That is not a crazy outcome for his free agency to me. We will see. So thank you guys a ton for getting through these player season review grinds. I know that everybody's interested in offseason stuff, but I have to, have to, have to finish reviewing all the players from this past season. Who I am, I love the basketball part more than the roster part, and I just have to talk about this stuff. It's very interesting to me, and I hope some of you are enjoying it as we get through this month of May. The last month that's really every team can still kind of consider it their season to me. You know, next month only two teams are playing. So thank you guys for listening to this. Tomorrow, again, we're back on the Prospect Grind with Jalen Duran from Memphis. Should be awesome. Thank you guys a ton for listening, and we will see you then.